guys good? I love it. I love it. I love the energy. Man, doesn't, whew, doesn't this feel right? Just being here together like this. Doesn't it feel like, are you glad we're back to this again? Yes. What a year. What a year. You want to talk about a game changer. 2020 was a game changer, wasn't it? Let's talk about it for a minute. Let's, you know, let's just talk about it because it changed everything, right? I remember the first time I heard about it. It was early in the year, you know, probably like January, February, something like that. Some people said it was around before 2020. If it was, I didn't know anything about it. The first time I heard about it was in 2020. And, uh, and I just, I remember hearing, the first thing we said was it came from China. That was like, it, it, this is a, it's, it's from China. And, and then I remember I'm watching it spread. Like I'm watching it spread this, literally like around the globe, it, it, it seemed like. And I told myself from the very beginning, I was just like, oh, I'm not getting it. Like, I'm like, I am not getting it. And then, like, as it was spreading more and more, like, eventually, like, people I knew, like, friends, like, started to get it. And I was, I don't know, I was like, wow, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. And, and, then, and then for the long time, it was like, kids can't get it. That was the thing. Like, it's not for kids. And, like, kids can't get it and stuff like that. But here's the thing. My daughter is in middle school now. My, my oldest daughter is in middle school. And it's like everybody in her middle school got it. And so eventually I just, I just broke down. It was about like April, something like that, May. I said, you know what? That's it. I'm getting it. So I downloaded TikTok. What did you, what did you think I was talking about? I was talking about TikTok. No, whew, TikTok's a game changer, isn't it? Does anybody mess with TikTok? Okay, first off, first off, let me say this. First off, let me say this. If you don't have TikTok, you don't need TikTok, okay? <laughs> like, stay gold, pony boy, stay gold. Because it is, when you first get on TikTok, it is the wild west. It is the wild west. I'm learning things I didn't even know before. Sheesh. I, don't, I didn't even know what that meant, right? Into the thick of it. <laughs> Poof, be gone. Your makeup is too, I got you, I got you. What is, what is this? That's not a dance move, okay? This is what you do after you've eaten B-dubs and you got to go to the bathroom real bad. You're just like, ah. But no, TikTok, it's like when you first get on it, it's like it's, it's the Wild West at first. Because when you first get on it, they just throw whatever video they want at you, right? They're just like, just throw it at you. You just scroll, scroll. It's like, oh, my eyes. You know, and it's, it's bad at first. But then after a while, though, after a while, like, you know, after you like some videos and you interact with it, like, it learns you. Like, it learns what you're into, right? And then it changes, like, a whole, a whole game. Like, if you go to my FYP, like, my, my FYP is just, like, it's, like, cooking, like, lessons and instructions, you know. There's, like, this dog that's, like, learning to walk, talk by pushing buttons. <laughs> you want to do? Yes! He's so cute. But uh, it's like, it's like you know, so that's the thing. But, but man, sometimes though, every now and then, one of those videos gets through and I'm just like, I don't know about this. Because TikTok, I, I've learned a lot in my old age from TikTok, okay. I've learned new words. I've learned new definitions. Like for example, apparently one of the words that changed in my lifetime, didn't know this, was the word thirsty. <laughs> that means something different today. You go on TikTok and it's like, oh, she thirsty. I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> flee, flee, you know. Because when I was growing up, because here's the thing, I'm a child of the 1980s. I was born in a different century than we're living in right now. But when I was growing up, if, I, if you said, oh, you know, if you talk about thirst, if you're talking about being thirsty, when I was growing up, if you said the word thirsty, instantly everybody in my high school would have thought of this person right here. It's Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time. <laughs> Sit down, LeBron. Sit down, LeBron. Going out in the first round. Get out of here. Anyway. But Michael Jordan, greatest uh, athlete of all time. That's him drinking a Gatorade. You want to know how old I am? That's a glass Gatorade bottle, people. <laughs> Gatorade used to come in glass bottles. Be better. But, um. 
But no, just so you know, so Gatorade was like, kind of like a brand new drink, brand new sports drink, started like in the 70s, but in the 80s it got to be really big. Michael Jordan was the first individual athlete that Gatorade sponsored. At that time, Gatorade was about a $500 million company. Michael Jordan turned it into a $1 billion company. And, and, and there was this, it was iconic. The image of Michael Jordan, you know, being on the bench with the Gatorade towel over his shoulders, you know, crushing the, the green cup and throwing it aside, going out, winning games. Like, like that was just like the thing. And, and, and the whole slogan for Gatorade was, you know, like, quench your thirst. Quench your thirst. And that's what, the, that's what thirsty meant to me. To, I guess this generation, it means something different. But, but here's what's interesting. When you really step back and think about it, it means the same thing. I mean, the word thirst, what it is, is it's to have, like, a carnal desire. Whether it's for intimacy or it's for something to drink it's like this carnal desire that you want fulfilled and then you will drink of something to fulfill that carnal desire here's what's interesting is you know there's all kinds of new things in the world but people don't change we're the same people we've been since the beginning of time human beings are exactly the same like you look at something like tiktok and you think like it's this new thing because it's like a new kind of trendy social media but well, things become trendy because they're cool. But things only last to become classic if they can maintain their relevance over time. And what's interesting is many things become trendy and then fade away. Not all social medias make it. RIP, MySpace, right? <laughs> but there are some things that last the test of time. Some things that are not just trends, some things that become holy tradition, some things that become, they come, become sacramental, they become, you know, holy unto God, and they last the test of time. And that's why I think scripture is. And there was a time that scripture was trendy, but now it's the sacred tradition that we get to tap into. And I want to show you tonight, I want to show you tonight that the exact same things you're seeing on social media today, the exact same things that society is crying out for, the exact same things that I believe humanity is thirsty for, that you can see it on social media today, it's the same things we've been longing for since the beginning. And the same answer to quench that thirst is still available to us today. So here's what I want to do with my time tonight. If you have a Bible with you, would you please get that out? If you have a Bible, however you follow along, you have a Bible app, whatever you use, could you please get your Bible out and open up to John chapter 4. And I really want you to get your Bible if you have it with you because this is going to be so much more meaningful if you can see these words on your pages. If you can see that I'm not changing these texts, this is what's in the actual Bible. And then later on you could go back and you could read this yourself when you know where it is and even underline some stuff. But John chapter 4 is where we're going to be. And I just want to talk about this interaction that Jesus has. Because it's a very unique thing. And so we're just going to read through it together. But let me say this. Could you just do me this favor? Whenever you're home, whenever you're by yourself, whenever you are reading your Bible, and I hope you're all reading your Bible by yourself sometimes, can I just say this? When you read your Bible, slow down. Just slow down. The, the, the purpose of Scripture, this is not like a book to be finished. We're not rushing to get through this text to say, I've read it from cover to cover. That's not the purpose. The purpose is not to finish this text. The purpose of this text is to allow it to be fulfilled in the way that you live your life. And so if you have to slow down and read it one line at a time and say, well, how do I live out that line in 2021? That is probably a more effective way to read Scripture. Let me show you what this says here. And we're going to go through a little bit slower, but look what it says. John chapter 4, we'll pick it up in verse 4. Look at that very first sentence. It says this. Now he, talking about Jesus, had to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria couple things just right there even in that one sentence in that one sentence there's a lot happening first off where are they if he has to go through Samaria where are they right now well right now they're in this southern region of the nation of Israel in this area called Judea I think we have a map of it here we could put up on the screen for you they're kind of like in that southern kind of peach kind of area down there in Judea namely they're in that city called Jerusalem 
which is the capital city, the holy city. And every year, many of the Jews would go down to Jerusalem for this feast called the Passover feast. Jesus is going to eat this meal three times with his disciples. Most scholars believe this is one of those times. So they would be in the southern region in Judea, but Jesus lived up in that yellow region, up by the Sea of Galilee. And so while they're in the southern region, they're finishing up the Passover, and then they have to go back up north. And Jesus says they had to go through Samaria, which is interesting. Because if this scripture is about geography, that sentence is a lie. If this sentence is about geography, that sentence is wrong. Because Hebrew people, Jewish people, did not have to go through Samaria, that teal kind of land in the middle. In fact, they would avoid Samaria. In fact, in Hebrew culture, after the Passover, many Hebrews would cross the Jordan River, right there about where Jericho is, and they would cross over to that green and purple side, which is modern-day Jordan. And then they would go up the river on that side, and then when they get to the north by Nain or Mount Tabor, then they would cross back over into their land. And the reason that they did this, because the Jews hated Samaritans. They did not like the Samaritan people. To the Jewish person, they would say the Samaritans' lives don't matter. And believe me, the feeling was mutual. Samaritans did not like Jews at all either. And not to mention that Rome is occupying this area and they don't like any of them. But it's interesting why the Jews don't like the Samaritans. It seems so petty. The reason that the Jews who live in Galilee and in Judea would avoid this middle area right between them, the reason they did not like Samaritans was because that region had been conquered by other countries. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, people from different nations came into that area and they conquered it. And then they intermarried with the Jews who were there. So their children were no longer pure blood Hebrews. They were interracial. And so, so the Jews kind of looked down on the Samaritans because of their race. And then and then probably what was more problematic was not just the race, but the fact that then the people in Samaria, they started to follow the traditions of the Assyrians and the traditions of the Babylonians. And, and, and they started to worship some of the deities of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And so they ethnically started to live their lives differently than the Hebrew people lived their lives. So they were like not just a different race, they were a different ethnicity of people. Could you imagine living in a day and age where one race of people would be upset with another race of people? Could you imagine living in a day and age where people would be so silly that one ethnic group would look down upon another ethnic group? I could not even imagine. People are still people. And people are doing the same things today that they've always been doing. But it's interesting how this starts off. Jesus says, He had to go through Samaria. The only way scripture is accurate, the only way scripture is without error, is if that is not talking about geography, that is talking about purpose. Jesus had to go through Samaria for a purpose. He needed to teach his disciples something. And look what happens. Next verse, verse 5. So, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Look at this. Read it slow. Read it slow. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Two things to notice there. First off, notice why Jesus stopped at the well. Jesus is not thirsty. He's tired. But he has no issue with thirst. And then it's noon. And that's going to come in play because look what happens next. Verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now, this is a big deal. This is a huge deal. Because not only did the Hebrew people, the Jewish people have a problem with the Samaritans because of uh, the race, because the ethnicity divide between the region at that time. But in Hebrew culture, a man 
would not talk to a woman in public. Unless you were a spouse or a family member, you would not talk to a woman in public. In fact, in that culture, in that time, it was a patriarchal society, and, and, and women were often viewed as, as property, and they were not given the dignity and the respect. Could you imagine living in a day and age where one gender would deny another gender of dignity and respect? Could you imagine living in a day and age where two genders would villainize one another and divide one another apart and look at only at the negative qualities of one another? I couldn't even fathom that happening today. You see, people are people. And people still do what people have always done. But here's Jesus in Samaria. Here's Jesus dignifying this woman by talking to her. And keep in mind, it says it's noon. And that's a, big key, that's a big key point. Maybe you've heard some pastors talk about this passage before. But the fact that she's at the well at noon, it says something about her life. It, it says something about at least her desire for, for, you know, being left alone. Because it was not tradition for women to go to the well at noon. Most women would go to the well first thing in the morning. Before the sun would get hot in the sky, they would go in the morning. They would get, draw the water they would need for that day. They would take it home and they would use their day's amount worth of water. And then the next day they would go in the morning to get fresh water. The fact that this woman is showing up at noon is means she, she's hoping to show up when no one is there. And yet that is exactly where Jesus is. And that's exactly when Jesus talks to her and asks her for water. Now look at her response because her response is our response still to this day. Look what it says in verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew. Racial divide. And I am a Samaritan woman. Gender divide. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. What she's saying there is this interaction is not normal. What she's telling Jesus is, as I scroll through our community, as I scroll through the world in which we live, as I scroll through the culture of Hebrews and Samaritans, I don't see a lot of unity. I don't see a lot of peace. I don't see a lot of love. That's not what I see when I scroll through life. Jews don't talk to Samaritans. Men don't talk to women. That is the norm. Let me ask you. When you're scrolling through your social media, when you're throwing, scrolling through the Instagrams and Snapchats and TikToks, do you think that what you're seeing is normal? Do you think that's how society really is? It's easy to be convinced that way if that's all you're seeing. That's the way she thought life was. But Jesus had to go through Samaria. Jesus had to talk to this woman. Because Jesus had to break through the illusion of what everybody else was doing to show this person what the kingdom of God looks like. And to show his disciples what the people of God will do going forward. She says, how can you give me water? Verse 11, look what it says here. Oh, sorry, verse 10, back up, verse 10. This is Jesus' response. And I love this. And if you have your Bible open, if you're taking notes, you might want to underline this. You might put a note by this. Because look what Jesus says to her, verse 10. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And this is where Jesus is going to change things. She's not even going to recognize it. She's not even going to realize it. She thinks we're still talking about physical water. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. You're at this well because you're thirsty. But you're not just thirsty for physical water. You're thirsty for something to quench your soul. You're thirsty for something to satisfy you, your deepest carnal desire. And he says, and if you just come to this well and you just keep drinking this little water, this earthly water, you're going to keep being thirsty. If you want true, true water, then you need what I give you. I need to say that. I think that's true. I think what we need to realize is that God is trying to give us life to the full. 
Not life like you see on all the posters around you. Not life that you see the friends who walk next to you at school. Not life that you see with all the people in the community. Broad is the path that people are going through this world with hatred and anger and rage. But narrow is the group of people who are ready to be kingdom workers and who are willing to model the way that Jesus says to live. So he says to this woman, I have a different way for you. I have a different water for you. But she's not getting it. And so she says in verse 11, the same thing you and I still say today. Look what it says. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Because that's what we want, right? We want practical solutions. She went to that well with practical thirst for practical water. And when he didn't have a practical button, a bucket, then Jesus is, could not fulfill her need. Even though he's sitting there saying, I have what you really need. She's like, I don't see a bucket, so I don't, no thank you. And I cannot tell you how many people, particularly young people, have this thirst for justice. Have this thirst for Righteousness. And Jesus says, I fulfill that. And we say, but you don't have any power. You don't have shame that you're throwing at society. How are you gonna, how are you gonna bring justice and righteousness if you don't have a weapon to destroy that which is evil in this world? That's how people look at Jesus. Because I, I, I know that's true because of the conversations I have. The students in my youth group, they're, they're concerned about the, the racism and the sexism and these things going on in the world today. And they'll come to me, Brad, what are we going to do about bad people? There's so many bad people in the world, Brad. What are we going to do about bad people? You know what we're going to do about bad people? We're going to love them. What? We're going to love our enemies. But Brad, what? What if, we, what if we love our enemies and, 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 and they take advantage of us? What if they love our enemies and they get worse? What if, what if we love our enemies and, and they become more evil? That would be scary. That would be unfortunate. But what if we love them and they heal? What if we love them and they see a different way and they're transformed? I'm just doing what Jesus says, love your enemies. But for some of us, we feel like, no, we have to destroy our enemies. We have to destroy that which is evil in this world. Can I just say this? If you're trying to destroy that which is evil in this world, you are going to destroy this whole world because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you're going to try to destroy every evil person in this world, then you will destroy every single person in this room, including yourself. Violence begets violence. When you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. When we're trying to destroy humanity for being evil, we are destroying ourselves because we ourselves are evil. If you want to see righteousness in this world, the way to bring about righteousness is not forcing society to do what you think they ought to do. The way to bring about righteousness instead of forcing them, it's rather about focusing on yourself. And saying, what injustice is in me? What sin is in me? What ignorance is in me? And how can I work on that to be more like you, God? It's counterintuitive. It's not what you see, but it's what works. It's what gets the, the true water out of that well. And it's what brings up what people really are thirsty for. Because I'm telling you, I believe people are thirsty for true water. I love the way Jesus puts it in. Verse 13, verse 13, it says, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Here's what I believe. I believe we were all made in the image of God. Not just Christians. I believe every human being was made in the image of God. And I believe all of us have a cup. And we're thirsty for something. Everybody's thirsty for something. And we're going around this world and we're saying, drink a little of this and we're drinking a little of that and we're trying to fill our cup with anything that was satisfied, but it's all just, it's all fleeting. It's all, it satisfies for a moment and it goes away. And Jesus says, I have the true life that you're looking for. 
I have what you're really thirsty for. Let me ask you this. What are you really thirsty for? And then what are you drinking? Because it's not always the same thing. I, th- I see a lot of people who thirst for a lot of good things. In fact, I believe God puts desire, desires in us because he wants us to long for things that help us find him. He wants us to long for, for things that he knows will fulfill us. And I think God puts these desires in all of us, these carnal desires that we want to have satiated. But here's the thing. God puts those desires in us and then we get so thirsty because we go in this drought where we get far from God and we say, I'm just so thirsty for something real. And then Satan's like, well, then here, drink this. And we get this cup and we're so thirsty that we don't even expect it, we don't even look at it, we just drink it because everybody else is drinking their cup. And we don't realize that that which we're drinking is never going to satisfy us because it's not really what we're thirsty for. It's close, but it's a knockoff. In fact, let me just, let me give you a list. Some people do better with a list. When I ask you, what are you really thirsty for versus what are you drinking? Let me show you some of the things that that people drink. Here are some of the things that people in our world, in our society, this is what they drink. You can read it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. We'll put it on the screen. You don't have to turn there. But look what it says. It says, the act of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are the things that people drink. I bet if we were being completely honest, these are some of the things that you drink. And I get it, we're at church camp, and I get it, we're here at CIY, and I get it, we're here talking about being kingdom workers, but the truth is, some of us drink so much of this stuff that that last line holds true for us. We will not enter the kingdom of heaven if we keep trying to satisfy ourselves with this foolishness God says that's not the real thing that's not what's going to satisfy you in your small groups you can read down a little bit further what the real things you're thirsty for but you know what's interesting is these things that we drink they kind of tell you what you're thirsty for I don't know what your go-to sin is I don't know what your go-to drink is I don't know what it is that you go to to try to satisfy yourself but it's interesting when you go through these you start to see like look at some of them Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. You know what I think people who drink sexual immorality and impurity and debauchery, you know what I think they're really thirsty for? I think they're thirsty for love. Like true love. To be intimate with another person, to be known by another person, to be accepted and unconditionally loved by another person. And so they long for love, but they trade it for these fleeting moments of sexual immorality. Which here's the thing, you will never find intimacy by just giving yourself away to everybody who asks. That is not an intimate act. The only way to find intimacy is to reserve intimacy for one person. But for some reason, what we really long to drink, it's not what we put in our cup. Fits of rage or anger. You know, people who drink of fits of rage, you know what they're really thirsty for, I think? Justice. They want to see justice in this world, and they see what is broken in this world, so they get angry at what is broken. They want to hurt what is broken. They want to hate what is broken. But really what they want is for God to bring justice to this world and for that which is evil to meet its consequence. There's an interesting one there, um, Factions, dissensions and factions. A faction is a military term. It means a, like, a, like, a, like a platoon, like a group of people, like a clique. In the year 2021, I have never seen society more divided than it is right now. Choose your category. Politics, race, gender, ethnicity, income, education. 
We are dividing ourselves up into factions. You know what I think people who divide themselves into factions, you know what I really think they are thirsty for? They're thirsty for unity. But they feel like it's not safe to have unity with people who look different than you or think different than you or act different than you. But I love John chapter 4. I love that Jesus had to go to Samaria. I love that Jesus talked to this woman. And I love that this woman was honest with what she was thirsty for. She was honest with who she really was. And she told Jesus who she was. And Jesus says, I know. I know who you are the whole time. And now that you've told me what you're really thirsty for, I don't want to give you just the water the world gives. I want to give you this living water that will truly satisfy. Look how this story wraps up. Look what she's really thirsty for. Verse 15, it says this, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty again and keep having to come back here to draw water. So he told her, look what he says, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Something happens when we stand in the presence of Jesus. And we just own our brokenness. When we're not too busy pointing out the flaws of this world. And we ask Jesus, can you fix my heart? Because I am thirsty for something real. I am thirsty for something genuine. And I keep messing up and drinking this junk. Would you give me what satisfies? Not just so that I could be satisfied, but so that it could become a living spring in me. And I could take this to others. That woman says she had five husbands. I cannot tell you how many pastors I've heard preach that verse. And how many pastors have said with certainty, you see how sinful that woman was? She's been divorced five times. Is that what that verse said? Did that verse say for sure that she was divorced, divorced five times? Or did you, did, can you read it slower? And does it actually just say she's had five husbands? Here's what I love about that story is we don't know exactly what her baggage is. Maybe she's had five husbands. And maybe she's been a widow five times over. Maybe she married her high school sweetheart and he passed away. And maybe she married again and he died. And, and maybe that's happened so many times that now she only goes outside in the middle of the day because she doesn't want to run into anybody else. She doesn't want to risk falling in love again. And she doesn't want to be vulnerable because everybody she loves dies. And she's there at that well because of that reason. Or maybe she is. Maybe she is divorced. Maybe she has been divorced five times. But maybe none of them are her fault. Maybe she's been abused and taken advantage of and hurt five times over. Abandoned and thrown to the side five times over. And the reason she goes to that well at noon, when the sun is highest in the sky, is because that's the only time in the day that she feels safe enough to leave her home where she can see who's around her because she doesn't want to get hurt again. I don't know what she was thirsty for, but Jesus did. And in that holy, honest moment, Jesus says, I know you, and I know what you're longing for, and I know what you're drinking. Would you pour that out and let me fill your cup with living water? And church, I'm telling you, that is what our Lord still does to this day. That is a tradition that has not gone out of style. God still fills the cup of the thirsty. He still fills the cup of those who are seeking justice and righteousness. He still fills the cup of those who are longing for more in this world. And I believe tonight, if you would be honest with Jesus, if you would confess to the Holy Spirit of that which you had been drinking, I believe he'll still fill your cup as well. I love the way 
John puts this in the book of Revelations. The very last chapter of our Holy Bible, almost the very last verse of our Bible. Revelation chapter 22 verse 17 reminds us of this eternal truth. The spirit and the bride say come. And let the one who hears say come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes Take the free gift of the water of life. Move. That spirit, our Jesus, is here right now. And he has the same water he gave that woman ready for you. What do you have in your cup? And what do you want to leave here with? to drink deep of all the days of your life? That's a question that only you can answer. But I pray it be that living water from Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, I come before you, and Lord, that's my prayer. My prayer is that you would pour out your living water. Holy Spirit, pour out your grace. And Father God, I pray that you would satisfy the souls of these students in this room. Not just for their benefit, but God, that they may leave this place and become a spring. Wherever they go, a living spring in their homes, a living spring in their schools, a living spring in this world that brings in the quenching, quenching living water of your kingdom. And Father, may we flood this world with that which truly satisfy, with that which truly saves. The name of Jesus, our Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that you are for us, not against us. We thank you that you modeled that we should be for all. And we thank you that we could drink deep of your living water. We praise you in that name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.